I'd like to share with you an important principle of clinical reasoning um, which links up very closely to the investigation of a crime scene. Now when you come across a crime scene and there's been a break-in or a robbery or a murder then one would look for clues and then try to put these clues together in a very logical fashion. Now the same is true for clinical cases. If you see a patient with a certain um, range of clinical symptoms and signs you need to put it together and try to make sense of it. Now I want to show you a very simple way of trying to make sense of what has happened to a patient. Now at the end of this talk if you continue to the end you will have a very powerful tool to take a lot of complicated information and put it together in a way that will not only be easy to remember when you have to present it but also uh, make a lot of logical sense. So let us start um, by looking at this case of a 33 year old woman presenting with a relatively short three week history of progressively worsening fatigue. She is known to be HIV positive but not very compliant. She admits to not taking her combination antiretroviral therapy regularly. On examination she's pale, she has mild jaundice and the tip of her spleen is palpable below the left costal margin and a full blood count was done which showed a normal white blood cell count but a low hemoglobin of 6.7 so she's anemic, a high MCV or mean cell volume which means that the red blood cells um, on average seem to be larger than normal, we'll come back to that. Platelets are normal and then she has a increased unconjugated bilirubin. LDH or lactate dehydrogenase is also increased, 670 is clearly raised. The haptoglobin is low and her Coombs test is positive. Interestingly enough, it was also found that the red blood cell folate was low. B12, vitamin B12 and iron levels were normal. So if we put all this together, we can see that this patient has anemia and the fact that both the LDH and the haptoglobin are low points towards this combination strongly points towards hemolysis. Now this is further supported by the fact that the bilirubin is also increased. So it seems pretty convincing that she has hemolysis and we have the additional information that the Coombs test was positive which tells us this, that this is a an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So we're dealing with a patient with fatigue and I want to start with the fatigue as the first chain um, or link in the chain of events that we're dealing with here. So we have fatigue and the question is why is she fatigued and you will hear me ask this question why very often because the whole um, discovery and f sorting out of the chain of events is based on asking the question why 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 until you cannot answer that question anymore. So let's start with fatigue and say why is she fatigued? Well she's fatigued in this case most likely because she is anemic. So we'll just put HP that is low as anemia here. Why is she anemic? Because of the well, at least one reason would be the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Why does she have that? Well, most likely in her case because of the HIV. So we have as a chain of events here HIV leading to hemolytic anemia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia which then leads to fatigue in this case. So let's call this chain number one. Then we could say okay there could be some side chains here or other chains that are also important. What else happens? Well when the red blood cells are broken down then there will obviously be a release in hemoglobin which will lead to a decrease in haptoglobin and there will also be an increase in bilirubin. So let's just put here increase in bilirubin which will lead to jaundice. Jaundice. So we can say 
this one here this could be a second chain so the green one here is the first chain this one will be the second chain and in a similar fashion we could start adding other side chains such as one here that we could say that is um, the autoimmune hemolytic anemia led to a large spleen and so forth and so forth so this could be chain number three now apart from just looking at the simple and obvious chains um, one needs to take this to a slightly deeper level and one of the things to look for is well are there any modulating factors things that are affecting the chains that are maybe not directly inside the chain but it may have an influence from the side well let's have a look here we see that she's not taking her combination antiretroviral therapy regularly so this could potentially be a modulating factor here because patients who are not on treatment for their HIV or not taking their treatment regularly are more likely to have immune dysregulation and more likely to have autoimmune hemolytic anemia so where we practice um, the most common cause for autoimmune hemolytic anemia these days would be HIV and this would be more common in patients who are not on treatment or not taking uh, their treatment so her lack of compliance or adherence so let's just say decrease we'll take a down arrow there decreased compliance has modulated this factor here the HIV leading to the autoimmune hemolytic anemia the second thing to notice is that with chronic hemolysis not only will you develop a large spleen or palpable spleen but the bone marrow will also try to compensate so one of if we lengthen this chain, chain now so the patient has got a low HP she's fatigued and now what would naturally happen with a low HP there would obviously be a stimulus so let's let's continue a chain here so that would mean decreased oxygen delivery to the kidneys that would lead to an increase in erythropoietin an increase in erythropoietin will lead to an increased red blood cell production in the bone marrow which will lead to a increase in the number of reticulocytes and I've shown you here a special stain showing that this patient has got these um, larger cells that are reticular sites circulating in the peripheral blood normally they would stay in the marrow but in cases of emergency where there's a rapid fall in HP and where the bone marrow can compensate these cells would move into the peripheral blood and help with oxygen carrying now because the bone marrow is trying to compensate it is using a lot of ingredients to make red blood cells such as B vitamin b12 folate etc now the body has usually has a, a large store for vitamin b12 which will take a very long time to deplete but the folate stores are not usually that large and can be depleted quite quickly and this may be the explanation why in this case this compensation in the bone marrow trying to increase the red blood cell production may have led to a decrease in the folate and this is what we what we saw here the folate levels are low now what does this mean well for one we saw that the MCV was increased and the f obvious question is what would the cause of that be and that is there, there are more than one reason here one it could be the increase in the reticular sites because they are very large and they will increase the average cells red cell size and increase the MCV or it could be the decrease in folate which typically gives a macrocytic uh, type of anemia but now you can see that this new ch side chain this red cell com this compensation chain where folate was depleted could now be modulated on its part so let's see how this happens well the folate will have a negative effect on the compensatory ability of the bone marrow because without ingredients the bone marrow which is the factory of blood cannot work and this will lead to a worsening in the anemia 
So if this is not working, the anemia will get worse. The next thing to notice here is that obviously, although the autoimmune hemolytic anemia would be the key reason for the low hemoglobin, there could be another modulating factor, namely the HIV. The HIV itself could cause, through a mechanism of anemia of chronic disease, could lead to a low HB, or the HIV could affect the bone marrow. Let's just go like this and cause bone marrow dysplasia, which could lead to poor production of poor quality and lower number of red blood cells. So you, you see that eventually all these chains of events, when put together, actually change into a network of events or a network of chains. And it's a very good exercise for you to try and de define these chains, to find these sequences of events, um, because this will really help you make sense of what is going on with the patient. Now, this is not the end of the story, because there's a next level here. And this is now very important because you've now identified what the problems are, what the sequence of events were, but now you want to do something about it. And this is now where the treatment part comes in. So you're going to start the patient on treatment here. So you are adding to the chain of events. So your treatment, let's say, would be, let's say you would treat the autoimmune hemolytic anemia with steroids. So you are adding a chain in the chain, a link in the chain of events that will hopefully improve uh, or stop this process from happening but at the same time so you can actually try to you you're trying to interrupt the chain here to stop any further complications from happening this is what you're trying to do with your treat treatment so this is going to be hopefully something good you want to inhibit the autoimmune hemolytic anemia but what we must be careful here is we can actually now start a new chain of events because the treatment could have complications, let's say side effects, such as, well, the patient could, could develop uh, corticosteroid-induced diabetes or osteoporosis um, or many other side effects, as you, as you well know. And this part is what I like to call where we must practice anticipatory medicine. I'm not even sure that there is a real word like this, but I think you must anticipate what can happen from this important point where you are responsible for adding chain uh, parts or, or for lengthening the chain by adding treatment or doing something for the patient, whether you're treating them with medication or surgery or whatever the case may be, you have to anticipate what could potentially happen and do everything in your power um, and everything that is reasonable to try and prevent any complications and any further negative effects along this chain. And hopefully, if you do that, you will help your patients quite a lot because you can um, you'll manage the, the, the original problem, interrupt this negative chain and uh, monitor the patient very carefully for the development of complications. One way, for instance, would be to give the patient vitamin D and calcium to prevent osteoporosis if the patient is on steroids. But it's a deliberate effect where you think about what are you doing and what are you going to do and what is going to happen to this chain here. Um, in this patient, you will replace folate because you know the folate is low, so you will that will be a low risk intervention because we know folate therapy has got very few side effects. So this is a relatively safe um, intervention. By giving folate, you don't expect much complications. Um, you can treat the HIV, but once again, the treatment of the HIV may have side effects that you need to look out for. So for every step in the chain where you intervene, you need to anticipate and think very carefully about what you're doing. So that's my story. Keep on asking why until you've completed the full chains, uh, chain of events and ask yourself not only why, but what can happen. And I think with these uh, 
principles and if you've practiced them on a lot of patients you're going to find that examinations are just so much easier enjoy <music>